So thanks a lot, Francisca, and uh, yeah, take it away. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm super excited uh, to talk to you guys about some of the research we've been doing. Um, yeah, so uh, as Laura already said, I'm a research scientist at uh, what is now Meta AI. Um, and I focus on lifelong learning for robotics. And more recently, I've specifically been focusing on learning reward functions. And uh, especially the second part of the talk will then be about reward functions that generalize. Uh, this is the first time I talk about uh, this uh, second part. So if you have questions or something is unclear, please don't uh, hesitate to interrupt because uh, as most of you know, when you're presenting something for the first time, you tend to forget some of the important details. Um, okay, let me start with uh, my motivation for lifelong learning um, and then I'll go into the reward function learning part. Okay, so um, when I think about robots learning to perform things, I think about like a very diverse set of tasks, things like we see here um, on the slides. Um, and uh, really it's many skills, but also with just infinitely many variations. And my hypothesis uh, is that we can't prepare the robot for all of these uh, skills and these uh, infinitely many variations. Nevertheless, uh, the predominant assumption is still that robots have a one-time training phase uh, such that we try to prepare the robot for everything that might ever happen. And then we let them go into the wild real world uh, uh, to perform the tasks that they've been trained to perform. And specifically, I see kind of two main efforts emerging, emerging that kind of speak, that use this uh, one-time training phase. And it's kind of these uh, simtorial efforts where you train uh, a robot to perform many, many different tasks in simulation and then the, the research effort or some of the effort needs to go into making simulations realistic and hopefully, um, you know, the learned representations will transfer to the real world. And then we also, of course, have all these uh, large scale uh, efforts in the real world where you just have robot clusters learning um, many different tasks in the real world directly and hopefully that learns uh, um, representations to generalize to new tasks. Um, and, you know, there's uh, nothing wrong with these efforts, of course, but they still use this um, assumption that once you've done this, you're, you're sort of done, you can take your robot and, uh, you know, have it do new things, but I just don't think that's going to work. Uh, instead, um, I think we need to think more about how can we enable a robot to always be ready to learn and adapt, right, to anything in the in the real world, basically. Um, and so then I start thinking about, okay, so a robot has a learning framework. Um, it uh, wants to perform, maybe learn how to perform, how to water your plants, right? Uh, what what are, are the things that the robot needs to know? Well, we need to kind of initialize a policy or a model. We need to know the learning rates. We need to know what, op what it needs to know what optimizer to, to use to, to optimize its policy or model given the data. We need some loss and reward function. Uh, and all of this needs to somehow be given to the robot. Um, such that it can actually learn these new tasks. And that, that's where uh, things already get stuck for me in this lifelong learning uh, framework, because we, right now, we tune these things, right? We, by, uh, by we, I mean, we, the experts, the roboticists or the machine learning experts uh, tune these uh, parameters such that the robot um, or the virtual agent for that matter can learn uh, a new task. And so the first thing that uh, I think we need to do, uh, think about is how can we actually minimize expert intervention such that a robot can learn autonomously in, in the real world or in the virtual world. Um, then the second thing is once you fix that, um, you also want to worry about continual learning because you don't get a nice training distribution over uh, 
variety set of tasks in the real world, right? You come, the tasks come as they come basically based on the human you're interacting with and that's what you get to learn from. Um, and you don't want to uh, forget previously learned skills, right? And then of course, uh, learning in the real world itself comes with uh, challenges. Uh, one of them is that you want to learn from a realistic number of trials and there's many, many ways of uh, trying to address this problem. One of the things uh, that I am going to focus on today is uh, thinking about how can we learn representations that generalize and how can we use structure. Um, and to that point, actually, so today specifically, I have touched on all of these things throughout my career so far, but today specifically, I'm gonna talk about how can we learn reward functions um, such that we don't have to manually tune these reward functions for every new task that the robot wants to learn. Um, and we can do this via meta learning or inverse reinforcement learning. And then um, how can we make sure that these representations that we've learned here actually generalize to new tasks? So this is sort of the outline of the talk that I just gave you. Um, I'll jump right into learning the reward function bit and then we'll go to the generalization part. Okay, so the foundation of uh, how we currently learn reward function is um, basically on this slide. Uh, we have been using um, gradient-based bilevel optimization to learn reward function. And this is going to take a moment to digest um, so let's focus on this uh, left-hand side of the slide where we have these two levels um, where the upper level um, optimizes a reward function. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into the details right now. I just want to give you like a rough picture. We, we have a level that optimizes a reward function. That reward function is sent to this lower level or the second level that uh, uses that reward function to learn a policy. Um, so this reward function now gives the signal of how to train the policy. And we, we do this, let's say we do like a full rollout here of the learning procedure with whatever reinforcement learning algorithm you want. At the end, you have a policy that you've learned with this reward function and you send um, this final rollout that you get back um, to the upper level and that now measures either through, here I have set uh, through a demonstration. So let's say we do have a demonstration. You measure how well this rollout performs against the demonstration. And this is then the signal that you use to update the reward function. And so this is like a fully differentiable framework. Um, so when we send the reward function down to the lower level, uh, we have some parameters psi that define the reward function. Um, and because with the RL algorithm that we're using in this lower level is going to be fully differentiable, we can actually differentiate through this whole step of policy optimization. So this is all, so this is actually one of the um, assumptions that we're making that we can differentiate through uh, this lower level. Um, I've explained this right now for reward learning. We have shown, uh, we have done this for many different things for actually also loss learning for regression and classification tasks. Uh, we have developed algorithms that do model-based reinforcement learning, model-free reinforcement learning in the lower level and learn reward functions um, on the top level. Uh, and we have uh, done this with both demonstrations or just um, under specified rewards, let's say. I don't know if I want to say sparse rewards, but under specified rewards. Um, so all of this can be expressed in the same framework. Um, and that's sort of the foundation of uh, the rest of the talk. Are there any questions about this? Uh, this part is always the hardest. <laughs> I was just curious. Uh, yeah. What does L mean here? Is it like loss function? Do we have it's any? A, yeah, it's we call it usually like the task loss or the outer loss or the meta loss. It's the loss that we take that we um, design such that the we can measure how well the rollout of the lower level performs. So in K 
case, when we do inverse reinforcement learning, we assume we have access to demonstrations up here. And then we define the loss on the demonstration and that rollout that comes from the lower level. Um, and it's just mean squared error, for example, the difference between the demonstration and the rollout. Okay, thanks. Cool. Any more questions? Hi, yeah, I have a follow up question. Sorry, we're in the same room here. Uh, on that, does that mean that, like with this approach, at least uh, the IRL, you're not really going to be able to go beyond the demonstrations because your reward function is only your reward function is effectively optimizing the policy to look exactly like the demonstrations rather than to be a reward function but the demonstrations were following or something um okay. that's a it's a really good question and we will get i will get to this uh in the second part of the talk the surprising result is, is this is actually what you just said is exactly what happens with maximum entropy methods, but not with our approach. And uh, I'll show you the, we don't understand fully yet why, but I'll show you some plots that highlight this. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, then I'll just go into some cool examples of how we've used this framework. Um, and then we'll go to the generalization part. Okay, so one of the concrete applications that we've used this framework for was um, to learn reward functions, or in this case, I would almost say cost functions from visual demonstrations. And there are these cute GIFs that <laughs> demonstrate how already as babies, we sort of imitate humans uh, from just visual input. Um, and so, uh, we were able to realize such a framework with our bi-level optimization framework as well, learning from visual demonstrations. And so concretely, um, you see me here giving a demonstration um, for a robot of how to place the bottle, that this blue bottle. Um, we extract some visual uh, key points um, on that bottle. And that's what the robot gets, this trajectory of key points. It learns a reward function from that. And then it will try to learn a policy or an action sequence in this case that minimizes that reward function such that it repeats the task. Um, and just to give you kind of the big picture here is, um, for me that ideally my, my, in my dream world, basically, the model can learn some, uh, the robot can learn some model of its uh, itself and the environment and you know what how its action affects the environment. In this case, really the environment is only the bottle. It's not aware of the rest of uh, the environment. Um, but ideally in my world, uh, the robot can learn such a model that you know, given action and state, it can predict the next state. If you have such a model and if that model generalizes, then all you need to do is to learn reward functions that can, in combination um, with this model, solve the task. So for me, the model is task independent and then the reward functions is really, or the cost functions is really how you describe the task. Um, so this is what uh, I'm, where I'm coming from uh, in this work. And, um, Again, we uh, can uh, frame this now within this uh, bi-level optimization framework where the lower level is a model-based approach now. Um, we have a model that operates in the latent space, in the visual latent space that predicts, uh, given the current visual latent space, so that's the key points and the actions that joint uh, um, changes in the joint state basically. Uh, predicts how what the next visual latent space will be. Um, we have a policy that predicts actions given the latent state, and then the reward function is what we optimize on the. Um, uh, this is a, uh, these are structured uh, reward functions in this work, um, uh, and then the rollout is going to be the predicted through the model the predicted. Um, key point sequence of the final policy that we optimized in the lower level. So this is what's going back. And then that's how we can only, so we only measure 
the distance in the visual space of the demonstration, right? So because the robot doesn't have access to my joint angles or anything, right? So we only measure the distance in key point space up here in the upper level. So the, the, this is the mean squared error but the, between the demonstrated visual trajectory and the predicted visual trajectory of the policy that was optimized in the lower level. Um, I hope this was clear. <laughs> Um, this is essentially what's happening here. And then um, once we have that reward uh, function that is optimized here, the robot uh, uses the model that it has to optimize the action sequence to execute um, the task for whatever start goal configurations that we give it, basically. Um, let me very quickly jump through this. Um, how we train, optimize the actions. So we have uh, some key point detector that extracts uh, the initial position. Uh, so we have an initial position that we assume. We have a key point uh, detector that extracts these visual key points. Um, we have a model that given the key points, the joint state and the action predicts the next joint state and key point. Um, and we roll this out for a fixed time horizon. We know what the goal position is supposed to look like. So we assume someone gives us a visual state of the goal that we want to achieve and extract the goal key points. And now basically you have the sequence of predicted key points um, and the goal key points and you formulate a cost on this. Um, you can think about mean squared error right now. But uh, for example, in this specifically weighted mean squared error where each key point gets a different weight. Um, and we want to learn this cost function, right? This is the goal here. And uh, the way, uh, let me check. Right, okay. So actually, let me, um, The way we optimize the action is basically by, we have this rollout um, of T time steps where uh, each of these actions here is a variable as well. And um, as you have this cost that is fixed in the, one, in the lower level, in the upper level, the cost is updated, but in the lower level, one, that cost is fixed we use this cost to backpropagate basically to the actions too, such that they uh, change, such that the, this cost is minimized. And then in the upper level, this cost is uh, updated based on the demonstration that we had. Um, the key point detector is uh, trained simply by uh, collecting a bunch of data where we randomly rotate the bottle around um, only so we put the arm into different random configurations and then only rotate the end effector such that it's um, moving the bottle. And that's uh, basically the signal for training the key point detector. So this is almost fully self-supervised except that I had to program the robot to move to certain configurations. Um, and then key point dynamics model is a neural network. Um, the joint state, predi the predicted joint state is a for just simple forward integration. Um, and yeah, so I can show you some results now. Are there any questions about this kind of pipeline? I know this was a bit much detail. Okay, let me just show you some results. Um, we have uh, tried out uh, a variety of uh, cost functions. One of the things that I want to point out is really, um, if we don't learn the cost function, but we just use a, a mean squared error on the key points, on the goal key points that you see projected here into the image in this uh, video, and the um, current key points, if you just try to minimize the distance between the, these goal and current key points, then the robot starts to collide with the shelf just because it directly goes for uh, those goal key points, basically. 
But uh, with our learned cost functions that have some time dependency, like uh, this one and this one, you actually see that the robot learns to first minimize the x. This is the x. Yeah, I think the x direction um, of the key point. So first minimize the distance in x direction and then minimizes the y direction. So it just moves first uh, over the shelf and then down like it was demonstrated um, in, uh, in, the, yeah, in my demonstration. So this is kind of was a neat result. Yeah, so we have a couple more videos of this. Okay, so this was kind of one of the first uh, results that we had on the real robot um, that we learned um, structured reward functions um, for a simple manu manipulation task. At test time, we did very start and goal configurations, but there were some struggles here, right? And so these struggles were what kind of inspired some of the next work. One of the biggest struggles is really learning this model um, and learning this model such that it actually generalizes to new start goal configurations. So in this, in this work, we had chosen structured cost functions because this was one of the biggest variables in my mind, whether we can learn cost functions that generalize. And when you move to a real robot, you don't, like I don't want to experiment with these kind of generalization experiments immediately. Um, but I was at least hoping we could learn a model that sort of generalizes across um, a small action space uh, and state space around the demonstrator uh, or around the, yeah, the task that was demonstrated so that we can test uh, different start goal configurations. But this is actually incredibly hard to learn. And then the way which was some of uh, the way we actually got to learn around learning this model is to actually program the robot to execute this, uh, this motion of placing the, the bottle with expert controllers in multiple start goal configurations. So we co collected a bunch of data um, such that we could actually train this model um, because it was impossible to train this model from more random data. So I had to literally implement an expert controller to, uh, to get a model that predicts well enough. Um, um, and so that's one of the challenges I want to put out there that people should be working on models, learning models that generalize. Um, this is uh, incredibly important for any model-based approach. Um, and yeah, it's tough. Um, in, we have some follow-up work uh, that where we use structure uh, to improve this model. And I would very quickly touch on this because this is uh, at the level of generalization of the model. But then I really want to talk about how we can learn unstructured cost functions because we had to put a lot of structure into this cost function to make it sort of learn something that we can uh, use to generalize at least a bit to start goal for configurations. Um, but ideally, I don't want to put that much um, expert uh, knowledge into these cost functions. So the second part is going to be about learning unstructured cost functions to generalize. Um, so let me quickly talk about the challenges of learning this visual dynamics model concretely. Um, the key points from this, uh, the, we used an off-the-shelf key point detector. Um, they do not necessarily fall on the object and they are also not forced to consistently track the same part of the object. Um, that was one of the issues that then affected the visual dynamics model that we learned. The, the key points are in 2D image space, which means the dynamics model is learned in 2D space, but the control actually happens in 3D workspace. So that was one uh, challenge. And then the poor generalization of the learned uh, neural networks models, as I've already um, mentioned. So those were some of the challenges of this visual dynamics model. We, we, we put those into two uh, classes. The first, the better key point detector, and then learning a model that sort of works actually in 3D 
um, and generalizes better. And uh, this is a very uh, quick description of uh, the key point detector that we used uh, off the shelf. We have an RGB image that uses a ResNet to encode the visual feature map. Um, then ignore the step of the combined feature map because this is only important for us, <laughs> the next step. And then this feature map uh, is then condensed into like it's bottlenecked into key point probabilities. Um, and then uh, from these key point prob probabilities on the key points, basically another ResNet is supposed to reconstruct uh, the RGB image. And then you measure the loss on that RGB image. So it's kind of a um, reconstruction uh, architecture. And so, like I had mentioned, these key points were not forced to fall on the object, but that's what we cared about, right? Um, so what we did is we used the joint state of the robot that when you know the joint state of the robot, you can compute where the end effector is. Uh, and together with the camera calibration matrix, you can actually project um, the end effector into the image. And so we created a kinematic feature map of where uh, the end effector is and um, fused that with the visual feature map from the RGB image. And that actually led to key points that were centered around the end effector basically and fell on the object. And these are just some graphs that uh, show you that when uh, we use this, when we use the joint state, which are the orange bars, we get, uh, we get most of the key points fall on the object. So lower is better here because we measure the distance uh, to the object center, basically, of the key points. And so higher is uh, worse. The baseline detectors had some of the key points just fall wherever in the image while uh, ours basically then led to the object, uh, key points falling on the object. And of course, I mean, just keep in mind for us, it was important because we knew we wanted to handle this object, but the, op the key points uh, fall on the object. If that's not the objective, then you, you want to do something else. Uh, what I found, yeah. About the um, graphs, what are the different graphs? Like, yeah, what's so, what the difference between the six? Oh, you mean, uh, so basically the, um, let's, let me try to, oh, we had different objects that we tested. Uh, yeah, I forgot to put that on. <laughs> so, yeah, that was for different objects we tested um, in simulation. I don't have that slide actually in this slide deck, sorry. <laughs> But uh, basically the x-axis is, uh, key, we tested also different key points, basically the number of key points that we are trying to detect just to see if that matters. Um, yeah, the, the takeaway really I want you to get out of here is that using something really simple, like using the joint state, I feel like the machine learning community has always, uh, there, there's always this hesitancy to use information from the robot, but, uh, information as simple as the joint state can actually really help learn better visual representations. And so we should do that. Um, and that's kind of the message I would uh, people would like people to get out of uh, this slide. Uh, in that context, what I found really interesting actually um, is that one of the things um, we did also test with is how much proprioception we need during training? Do we need the joint state for all of the uh, training data? Um, and it turns out that, uh, so again, lower is better here, that if we use, um, uh, so basically, even if we only use like 50% of the data with, uh, joint state. So if only 50% of the data receives a joint state measurement, uh, and then all the other are just visual uh, um, representations, 
um, then you still learn a much better key point detector. So you can actually uh, learn representations from passive data and active data together. Uh, and uh, the active part doesn't need to be 100% basically of the training data, um, which I thought was interesting. So that's also cool. Um, just to give you an idea of what this actually means. So this is on the right hand side was a typical key point detector result that we received, you know, achieved before uh, we merged uh, with the joint state. And then on the left hand side, you see uh, a typical result that we got with um, the joint state measurement. And so you can see that uh, these, of course, the key points, uh, because we are uh, want to manipulate the object, those key points are much more interesting when they fall on the body. Okay, so this was about uh, key point consistency. And then uh, how do we learn dynamics models that uh, generalize better? Well, in this case, um, well, I don't even, I think, I want to learn a better visual dynamics model. That's uh, what I wanted to do. Um, what we ended up doing is using the kinematic model of the robot again, um, and know that we have attached an object that has is represented by three key points. So we, we model this. That's a structured kinematic model like, that we can then also project into the image space. Um, and we want to find the placement of these key points in our structured model. And we do this, we frame this as a regression problem uh, by measuring basically the distance that we, when we project these key points that we're trying to identify of our structured model uh, into the image space. And we measure the distance to the key point that our key point detector predicts. And um, we try to minimize that distance by adjusting the location of these key points. And once we have done that, once we have found the placement of these key points, we uh, fix them. And now we have anyone who has uh, done robotics knows that we have like fixed kinematic models that can predict end effector location. Uh, we can now also predict the key point location if we join, move the joints around. And so that's what we ended up replacing. Um, and um, we repeated these experiments of the placing uh, task and we got better basically generalization um, as compared to pure dynamics, uh, neural networks models basically. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how bad the pure dynamics models are, if you try to learn them from random data, basically. Um, the, the orange line is what we get with our structured representation. Um, all the other lines are some form of neural network uh, that was trained on, uh, on random dynamics data. And you see on the x-axis is the time horizon. So how many steps you're trying to predict forward with this dynamics model that you've trained. Um, how, like it exponentially, like the error exponentially explodes. So the y-axis shows the error, the prediction error, and the x-axis, the time horizon. And as the time horizon increases, you you just see an explosion of the prediction error. And, and that's what I mean with, uh, that's the other axis of generalization, actually. It's uh, uh, over time, right? You need to generalize. The, the generalization error needs to stay small when you try to predict over a longer horizon. Um, we also have some quantitative numbers here, um, but I think the lines kind of communicated um, the main result. Uh, so I will jump to the latest research, which um, is, so, so far I focused on this whole pipeline of, okay, we learn a reward function, we learn that, use that reward function in conjunction uh, with a model, um, or we learn to, to extract the policy that uh, can solve a new task, or we just learn a policy and don't have a model that also works. Um, but then the, the rest was kind of, okay, how do we make sure this lower part actually generalizes? But 
So far, we focused on reward functions that had a lot of expert knowledge baked in, such that they learn something useful. And uh, the question that we asked next was, well, what if we want to learn neural network reward functions and not put in all this expert information? How well do they generalize right now? Then, if we do that, um, so you know, we ideally we want our robot to be able to learn a reward function, then apply it to similar situations. Um, that's kind of the idea to learn a policy um, for new situations is what I meant. And uh, I think so. That's kind of just to set the stage, right? So what we what. Ever I'm going to talk about next is has two phases of learning. The first phase of learning is the learning of the reward function, and that will focus on a set of tasks. And then the second phase, the evaluation phase, is also a learning phase, but it focuses on the policy learning uh, part, right? So the reward will be fixed in the second phase, and it will be used to learn policies for new tasks, basically. And that's how we evaluate generalization, whether these policies then can learn to achieve these tasks given the reward. Um, so I just wanted to mention this um, a priori because it's kind of important uh, to keep in mind. Um, we also, what we also do is because this reward function learning phase requires us to implicitly also learn policies, we also try to transfer these policies to these new tasks to see how well the policies um, generalize. Okay, so um, ignore these subtle triangles. This is a uh, PowerPoint import uh, issue. Uh, let me try to set the stage with the toy example about how we think about generalize learning generalizable reward functions. Um, we, uh, we are studying this in the context of inverse reinforcement learning, so we assume we have some demonstrations given. Let's say we have four demonstrations given from this is kind of a navi 2D navigation task where we have four start configurations and we want to move towards the center here. This is the goal um, and this is sort of the path um, that each demonstration shows how to get to the goal, right? Uh, and now the question is, what is this reward function like? How, what does this reward function to look like? I think all of you probably would immediately have an idea of what this reward function should look like. And um, we, what, how we test is that we, at test time, we will actually try to learn a policy from this start configuration. And so the question is, do we learn reward functions that can then actually assign a meaningful reward for this state, right? So this is the question we're asking. Um, and uh, this is already kind of just a quick uh, takeaway here is that what prior work does and prior work, this is literally most maximum entropy approaches that we could implement um, does something like this. It assigns high rewards on the demonstrations and low rewards everywhere else. So blue is low and yellow is high uh, in these plots. Um, and, and this comes out of the maximum entropy objective. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the maximum entropy uh, objective literally says the reward on demonstrations should be high. Demonstrated states should be high. Um, and um, we, I will show this for concrete algorithms. This is for the exact maximum entropy objective where you actually uh, evaluate it exactly, but this is typically not possible in high dimensional spaces. So there are lots of approximate algorithms that solve this for high dimensional problems. Um, on the right hand side, you see the reward function that we get with our bi-level um, optimization framework and we get this result, whether we use a model-based RL algorithm in the lower level or a model-free um, algorithm in the lower level. And again, I, we don't fully understand yet why we get this very different result. Our objective is, the, the, like I said, our objectives is very different from the maximum entropy objective because we use a imitation objective. We use the objective of 
the rollout of the policy that was learned in the lower level, um, that trajectory needs to match the trajectory, the demonstrated trajectory. Um, and so that's like an imitation objective. And so intuitively, we're asking our reward to lear learn, update its parameters such that it brings the policy learning procedure closer to the demonstrations. Um, and for some reason, this leads to rewards that look much more intuitive, uh, at least on this uh, toy example, um, than maximum entropy um, objectives. Um, so the, this is just to quickly explain maximum entropy um, problems is that you have this demonstrated trajectory again or to, that to reach the goal and uh, what the maximum entropy objective says, expert is great. Uh, so expert states are great, give it high reward. All the other states are bad, give it low reward. And that's how you come to, to this kind of um, reward function. And just to clarify again, a lot of, uh, so in our work, we, we just use uh, neural networks that get the current state that you're evaluating and is supposed to predict the reward, right? It's uh, highly unstructured. A lot of prior work on maximum entropy approaches actually uses feature-based um, um, uh, feature based reward functions that, uh, ex that use structured features. And then the reward functions would look different, but this is what you get when you use an unstructured neural network, basically. Um, Okay, I just wanted to repeat, this is the bi-level objective that we're using. So on this top level, we use this imitation objective and, and for all these results I'm showing next in the bottom uh, lower level, we use uh, PPO as an algorithm. Um, it's all state-based uh, experiments. Um, and what we're doing is we start uh, the training distribution around the demonstrated start points and use the demonstrations for the outer objective to guide the reward learning basically. And then at test time, we start, the, the start distributions are these red lines and we want to also achieve the goal and we measure generalization um, on those. And this is, gone, this is a handful. This is basically what you get when you do the training um, the top row shows training results for our algorithm and three different maximum entropy approaches uh, that differ in the sort of sampling and uh, uh, training, like how training is done, basically. Um, so you see all the maximum entropy uh, approaches have the star-like um, or this cross-like uh, result, basically, of the reward function. Um, and then on the test, uh, on the bottom row, you see the test result when you use these uh, reward functions that were trained in the, in the training to learn policies uh, for these new starting points. Um, yeah, you get various results. And what obviously happens is that um, for these cross-like um, rewards, the policies can easily get stuck on this, those diagonals because they have high rewards as well. Um, yeah, that's kind of on a toy example. And uh, we also uh, tested this on uh, in simulation on some reaching task um, where the robot is supposed to uh, reach certain configurations. Um, we uh, have uh, three starting uh, distributions. This is now all at, um, so at training time, we train in, we did a 2D slice here. This is done in 3D, but 2D is easier to visualize. We train the robot to reach a location uh, within that blue square here, basically. Uh, and then at test time, we have three, we transfer either the reward or the policy or both and adapt uh, the policy given the reward. 
Um, and we test on three goal uh, distributions to see uh, whether like how uh, with increasing difficulty, how well the approach is basically generalized, the reward functions that were learned uh, with the different approaches. The results here basically show the test phase training results with the reward functions that were trained on the flow distribution. Um, okay, let me walk you through these results. Uh, what we see first on the top row is all algorithms perform well on the training task. So we trained all of them to perform really well on the training task. Um, then as we move towards using the learned reward on the testing distribution to train new policies on the testing distributions, we see that on the easier setting, um, both, so AIRL is the main approach that we compared reward learning to, AIRL does well, also on the medium uh, one, but then on the, on the difficult distribution, it significantly drops performance. So suddenly the reward doesn't generalize anymore to this most difficult uh, generalization setting. What's interesting is also that we also test uh, policy uh, transfer because we wanted to know whether the rewards actually generalize, whether it actually generalizes better to transfer the reward to, to learn new policies on the test setting or whether the policy itself already generalizes well enough to um, the test setting. And we do see that the rewards do generalize better also for the baseline. Um, but I think there was one, there was one interesting result, but I don't see it anymore. <laughs> but uh, in general, um, the baseline's performance, pro ah, I think that in general, the baseline's performance actually drops. The reward starts to, uh, the reward performs worse in the difficult phase than the policy itself. That was the result. So that was interesting. Um, yeah, we also in this paper that we're, we're putting on archive soon, uh, we also show results for transferring both reward and policy and then adapting the policy with the reward instead of learning a policy from scratch, which is what we're showing here. Um, and that performs similarly well than to learn the policy from scratch, except you just need less uh, data. Um, and that was uh, it, that was my talk. This was uh, sort of the uh, summary of how we do reward function learning these days, and then how we think about learning reward functions that generalize.